This presentation is about a very unique rock called Trinitite and a little bit of history of how it was made. I say made because Trinitite is a human-made glass. It's a byproduct of nuclear testing. And more specifically, Trinitite was created in 1945 from just two ingredients, sand and heat. It's a glass, and the source material was the Arcosic quartz-dominated sand of the White Sands Missile Testing Grounds northwest of Alamogordo, New Mexico. This picture is from just outside the White Sands area on the left, and on the right, the amateur baker will have a little more difficulty acquiring the necessary heat because it was provided by a nuclear explosion. But there you go, that's all you need to create your own Trinitite at home. Okay, so that was an oversimplification and technically untrue. Unfortunately, besides being wildly illegal, setting off your own personal nuclear bomb in a sandy desert won't create Trinitite. Yes, you'll create glass and an international incident, but it won't be Trinitite. All of the Trinitite that is or ever shall be was created in one fell swoop on the morning of July 16, 1945, during the world's first full-scale test of a plutonium nuclear bomb. It was conducted at the Trinity Test Site, hence the name Trinitite, in the northern portion of White Sands Missile Range, and plutonium for the core of the bomb was actually refined up the road at Hanford, which is kind of the connection for the local story that I made for my geology group. Some people have called the detonation the start of the nuclear age. And the code name for the test bomb was the Gadget. Pictured here on the left, half assembled with future Los Alamos National Lab Director Norris Bradbury. It was an implosion designed plutonium bomb in which a solid core of a plutonium gallium hybrid it was surrounded by explosives. And then when those explosives detonated, the compression created a supercriticality in which uh, initiates a s nuclear fission chain reaction. The gadget used was the same fission mechanism as Fat Man, which was detonated over Nagasaki, and the other design, utilizing the aptly named gun method, has explosives that accelerate pieces of fissionable material into each other, and that initiates the chain reaction. This gun design was used in Little Boy Bomb during the attack on Hiroshima. So there were these two designs, but only the implosion method was tested at full scale before its use in warfare. Uh, remember, this was July 16th, 1945, and the United States was at war. In fact, America wound up using Little Boy and Fat Man less than a month after the test. But the reason they didn't do a full scale test of Little Boy was because they had tested you know, every other aspect except for using live material, and they were absolutely certain it was going to work. And the assembled gadget on the left there was as it's being hauled up to the top of a 30 meter tower in the White Sands Missile Range. The bomb was detonated at elevation for several reasons. It better simulated the effect of dropping the bomb from a plane. It reduced fallout by lessening the amount of ground material that got swept up into the blast. And it also helped maximize the amount of heat directed at the ground. And so with those components in place, we have the Trinity test. The first detonation of a nuclear device witnessed by around 425 military and research staff from the Manhattan Project. Uh, many people from neighboring towns saw the flash of light and the distant boom, and so the military, I think, had to create some kind of cover story saying uh, munitions factory exploded or fireworks factory, I forgot what they said. The effort was led, of course, by Oppenheimer, who would later recall, we knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. And from the Bhagavad Gita, he thought of the line, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And now if you don't, if you didn't before, you know that his quote has its origins in Trinitite and the Trinity test on July 16th, 1945. And it actually took me a while to make that connection. Uh, so the Trinity test was, of course, well studied, or it would not have been a very useful test. They used high-speed cameras, plenty of radiation detecting, and explosive monitoring equipment around the site. And from those measurements, we know, for example, that the fireball reached temperatures of up to about 8,000 degrees Celsius and had about a 22 kiloton yield. And just as an aside, this is the center image there is actually the only color photograph of the Trinity test. Everything else was done in black and white because that was a better resolution. So after the explosion, the world was obviously changed forever, and the first parts of the world to change were actually the gadget and the blast tower 
which were completely vaporized. In the photo on the left, just a few weeks after the blast, Oppenheimer, who's on the left, and General Groves inspect what's left of the tower. There's only some ground supports left. Now, the area was, of course, radioactive, but not to a dangerous level for short exposure times. However, it may be hard to tell, but they're wearing little booties over their shoes, and that was to prevent radioactive material from sticking to their feet. So on the right, flyover imagery shortly after the blast, and this one is from 28 hours later, shows very clearly this approximately 450 meter diameter dark patch, and all of that is trinitite. So quite a lot of it was created all at once. And so I mentioned earlier the desert sand was arcosic. This means it was mostly quartz, but has a substantial amount of feldspar, in this case microcline and albite, with lesser amounts of other minerals like muscovite, actinolite, and calcite. One important aspect of trinitite creation is that the desert sand wasn't just baked in place. Yes, there was a heat wave, but recent research in the last couple of decades has shown that the glassy trinitite was actually created as fallout after the explosion. This means that instead of being baked in place like a desert cake, the material was evaporated just like the tower and swept up into the fireball, and this was later rained out as glassy droplets that coalesced to form solid sheets of glass on the desert floor. So the Trinity test photo from less than one tenth of a second after detonation on the bottom right, I think shows this really well, where you know you probably focus on the fireball at first. More relevant to this talk is that I wanted to point out this dark ring around the base of the fireball, which is kind of wavy, and that's uh, the heat and shock wave sweeping up the desert sand and then so things get chaotically mixed together as it's vaporized. And then it all rains back down and cools into trinitite. Now trinitite has a number of cool and somewhat unique features and characteristics. Uh, one of the more obvious is the green coloration of most samples, which if you think about it, you know, it started out as this definitely not green sand. The green is due to iron, and I think specifically iron two plus in the glass. Another feature is the often smooth surface of trinitite, and that's sometimes described as having a mosaic or craquelure texture to it. And so I think that's apparent on the right there. Another characteristic is the vesicles. The glass was superheated as it was being deposited, and the desert was relatively cooler and had a bit of water in it. The heat boiled off water and other volatiles, creating a range of bubble sizes in the samples, and many of them were frozen in place in the subsurface. Uh, these varieties are the most common types shown here. Uh, this is just called green trinitite, and these are from the Notre Dame Research Collection. The top two photos are of the same sample, where the original surface is on the left, and the underside is on the right. The underside of that one and a couple other of these has another typical characteristic, which is unmelted sand stuck to the bottom. And once you're familiar with trinitite, it becomes kind of easy to tell which way was originally up, because you have that nice level, that nice surface to look at. There are a few other less common trinitite types, and these include red trinitite, which is still mostly green, but does have red streaks in it or red specks. And the red is due to copper, primarily from the wiring of the bomb and also the tower. And there's also black trinitite, which has lots of iron, and that's mostly from the tower. And now remember I said the tower was vaporized in the blast, and well, it had to go somewhere, right? The sample photo from Twitter has an actual blob of iron just sitting there on the top left, and its most likely source is the tower. You're not going to get that in the desert sand. The sample with the red triangle on the bottom left has streaks, from, streaks of red from copper, and on the right there are also beads and dumbbell shapes of trinitite, which formed originally as the molten glass coalesced in the air during the blast and cooled enough before landing to maintain their shape, occasionally stretching out into elongated forms because of their you know, centrifugal motion. So the Manhattan Project scientists did their best to collect as much information as they could from the blast, but we are definitely still learning new things about trinitite decades later. The reason I'm, I'm familiar with trinitite is because of a postdoc I had at the University of Notre Dame where trinitite was being studied because of its use in nuclear forensics. So I've spent quite a lot of time looking specifically at trinitite thin sections, where we take a slice of rock and plane it down to only a few tens of microns in thickness so minerals are transparent. 
This is a composite image on the bottom of a thin section of sample 5A8.86B, which, you know, just rolls right off the tongue. But you can see even in thin section that there's kind of the smooth top, and then this is the original surface of the sample, and then you get more vesicles as you go further down, and also more unmelted grains. It looks dirtier at the bottom because there's less glass and there's more minerals, and uh, those minerals that I pointed out earlier are still intact. And so one of our goals there was to figure out where everything was inside of these samples. And one of the techni techniques we used was micro X-ray fluorescence imaging to get the distribution of individual elements in the sections. We then used these maps to do targeted analysis. So say you wanted to research the blast effects on quartz. Well, then you look at the silica map and the brightest regions are quartz grains. So that's the yellow. Uh, if you want to look at feldspars, that's the potassium and aluminum maps, the calcium maps would show calcite. Or if you're looking for exotic components like the tower or bomb material, maybe copper or iron will show your regions of interest. And one, of the, one other thing I want to point out is how in the silica map, there are lots of angular bright regions, on the, especially on the top. And those are unmelted quartz grains, whereas the potassium and calcium maps, the blue and the red, have more diffuse patterns, especially near the original surface of the sample. And that's because those minerals have lower melting temperatures compared to quartz. And you can you can really see it with calcium having almost bands of higher concentration where calcium and glass flowed and created banding as it cooled. Whereas quartz is more resistant and it just broke up into chunks rather than melting. And in terms of sample characteristics, the last thing I wanted to point out is that Trinitite remains slightly radioactive. The levels today are safe enough where you can, if you wanted, handle most pieces with your bare hands, but it's still there. And for nuclear forensic purposes, we were interested in knowing exactly where that radioactivity is. The way we do that is there's a resin that is sensitive to alpha particles, which the Trinitite emits. And so the students at Notre Dame conducted alpha track radiography of all the thin sections. This essentially involves taping the resin onto the thin section, waiting a few days, and then digitizing the resulting tracks. And those look like this here uh, with the tracks in red, where each tiny red dot is an alpha track. And so you maybe you, you see this and you think at first that there's just you know five dots at the surface and that's where all the radioactivity is but those are actually clusters of hundreds of alpha particle tracks. A lot of it is diffuse, but there are two key takeaways I want to point out from this image. One is that there is still a lot of alpha track radiation scattered through the sample, even down to the primarily unmelted grains. And it is hard to tell, but it's only in the glassy regions. So it's not where the minerals are. They're not radioactive, it's just the glass. And the other more obvious characteristic is that there are very highly concentrated regions of alpha activity right at the surface. And so those may be the last vestiges of the fallout settling in before uh, it cools down. So the levels of radioactivity are, I think, well below background. However, I would still not advise you to wear Trinitite jewelry. And yes, that is a thing, at least historically. The most dangerous thing you could do, however, is accidentally swallow some Trinitite because even the weak radioactivity would start interacting directly with your tissues, which then in exponentially increases the potential for cancerous growth. So if you're dealing with Trinitite, wash your hands thoroughly before going out to eat chicken wings. Now, there are many other avenues of research being undertaken with Trinitite. These three examples came out of Notre Dame, where they showed that you could, for example, roughly tell how far from ground zero a sample was collected based on decay products of the bulk sample, notably 152 europium, because there would have been less neutron flux further from the tower. In addition, the source materials within the bomb is also an important avenue of research. Using a zinc as a proxy for copper on the bottom left graph there, we can tell that the wiring and other copper material from the bomb came from a mixture of two mines uh, from Michigan and Utah. And on the right, the lead is isotope signature is also best matched by a Canadian industrial mine in Buchans. Now these types of signatures are important because if something were to happen in the future, or even if a bomb was intercepted, 
then we want to know where the material came from to determine who these bad actors were, where they sourced the material, and then you can create a chain of custody from there of where everything came from. So speaking of dealing with Trinitite and radioactive stuff, uh, where might you go to collect Trinitite? Now, for years after the Trinity test, lots of reporters and tourists were able to visit the site, and it was essentially a free-for-all for anyone wanting to take a piece. I've, I even saw an account of some people bringing shovels to collect it and just hauling it into the back of their pickup truck. Ostensibly out of concern for latent radioactivity, collecting Trinitite at the site was banned in 1952. Everything on the market was therefore collected before 1953, and all of that is completely legal to trade. To reduce the environmental hazards of Trinitite just lying around on the surface, the government later bulldozed the Trinity site and buried all the rest of the material. I did read from one source that they kept a small surface exposure visible so tourists could see what the ground looked like after the blast. If you happen to visit New Mexico, especially around the White Sands Missile Range, you'll find a lot of Trinitite for sale. It is variably called Atomsite and Alamogordo glass as well. And so I'm not sure how prevalent fakes are on the market, but with all things rare, there are some Trinitite scams out there. If you know what to look for, I think you'll be okay. But honestly, the only way to be 100% certain you have the real thing is to have a spectroscopic or radiography investigation of the samples, like the one shown here on the right with decay byproducts still evident. And that's the beyond the abilities of most people. But a lot of dealers do have this kind of hookup with uh, some industrial source. So even if you, say, had a Geiger counter, it's possible that a sophisticated operation could implant small, naturally radioactive materials in there to fool you. I don't think authentic Trinitite is terribly expensive, but you'd have to be the judge for yourself. For an example of typical costs, the sample on the right from the Mineralogical Research Company is 5 grams, and a little over an inch long and an inch wide, and it costs $35. So about 8 to $10 per gram isn't unusual. Rarer, larger, or more unusual samples will obviously pr be pricier, upwards of $15 per gram, at least from MinResCo, which is where we at Notre Dame bought our samples. At the time of this presentation creation, the most expensive piece on their site was $107 for a piece that was about twice this size, and I think it had some unusual feature as well. So also remember that Trinitite formed as a surface layer deposit, and so it isn't very thick, and most samples aren't more than one to four inches across, with the majority being even smaller because it kind of crumbles naturally. Some places sell little vials of small pieces for less than $15, or larger ones, like the one on the left here, for which is a five-inch vial from the Adam Rock Shop, and that's about $60. If you find someone selling a basketball-sized piece, you know, just walk away. On the right, I found this sample of supposed Trinitite for sale for $65,000 on a, some kind of knockoff eBay site. You know, I can't say it's definitively a scam, but it's a scam. It really does not look like Trinitite. It's more blue-green than green, for example. There's no photos of the other side, so you don't know what it looks like over there. It's probably the same, and it's extremely thick. But I guess when you go all in like this, like they did, you know, they only need to sell one to make a fortune, and then you can just move on from there. Uh, my guess is that this might be a Venturine, which is just a variety of quartz, so that would be a pretty good profit margin for them if you were to buy it. Uh, but of course, it's not just fakes that might be out there. There are some rocks that genuinely are similar in formation or appearance, and they just might be mislabeled or tried to be passed off as Trinitite. Glass slag is one because it has lots of vesicles, it can be green, it looks heterogeneous, so you might have different layers. But I, th I think fulgurites might be the closest match, since they were formed by a similar brief high temperature burst of energy in sand. So compared to the trinitite below it, they're both you know tube-shaped roughly and green with vesicles. But note that the fulgurite is darker on the surface, whereas trinitite is still green. And this one has a that single layer of unmelted sand grains on one side for the Trinitite. Tectites are another possibility, and they are glass formed by meteor impacts or air bursts above desert sands. Uh, but those glasses tend to be clearer and bigger and chunkier, and I think they're rare enough that people wouldn't try to pass them off as Trinitite. 
they just rather sell them as tektites. And finally, I thought I'd wrap this up by showing you that what I can of my Trinitite collection, which I didn't even know I had for a long time. My grandfather died shortly after I was born, and I eventually inherited his rock collection. Uh, very few of the samples had identifying labels or sources, and so back in 2010, I went through and photographed a lot of what I was able to sort so I could th sort through it la easier later. I identified what I could, but many of the samples remained a mystery. And at the time, I had no idea what Trinitite was and wouldn't study it until almost a decade later. And just by coincidence, last summer I was scrolling through old photos and found this one on the right, uh, which shows the now very familiar green vesicular glassy samples. You know, smooth surface, it's got a couple of vesicles, obvious, they're thin. Uh, this is the only photo I took, so I don't know what's on the underside. And unfortunately, the bulk of my rock collection is still across the United States in New York. I still have to figure out how to get that here so I can actually take a closer look. But until then, I think I can say that these are strong candidates for being Trinitite because they have the characteristics I talked about earlier, and including that crocolure texture. I'd be interested to know if anyone else collects Trinitite or has visited the Trinity area before. So, you know, please leave a comment or question below if this presentation sparked your interest.